Well, I might just kind of play an opening song while it sets up. Uh, welcome back to everybody who is online and in here. Um, okay, here we go. I won't attack you like I did before. I'll just start gently playing. just tap back into some of what we were talking about earlier around the importance of remembering to feel and to think and to speak. finding the thing that you love and following that and acknowledging that and speaking to that. So this is a song for that. My acknowledgement of some of the things that I love. Singing a song for someone who is pure light a little light, like harnessing the sun in the middle of the night. You see, some souls, yes, your soul was brought into my light for reasons so clear, but chase them to speak them out loud. You are so, you are kind, you are woven. Advancing with your flaws on your sleeves, dizzyingly break in this world of pretense. I, I will follow you, my friends, who want to show. 
show me how to open my heart and choose him to embrace this fear. Show me how to open this heart and choose to speak, even in fear. Running across the concrete on a summer's day, a top of mountains when it's just too cold to bear. Top of icebergs were deep in the belly of the sea. I think how sweet it is to be here. Oh, nature, hoy, how powerful this heart. and brutal things tend to be but we're learning yes we're still learning never forget we're still learning we're always still learning be kind while we're learning Nadala, that was so good. Do you know Nadala made the first ever Carbon Neutral EP? Isn't that cool? Yeah. How cool is she? She's the best. Really good. And uh, if you're a Brisbane person, she's going to be a big sound. You'll see her on a bunch of panels there. Oh, tonight. Oh. If you get to Brisbane tonight, you can see her on big sound. Yeah. No, forget about it. You're here. Sucked in. All right. Hey, if you're in the room, um, feel free to tweet along. Use the hashtag 22 Better Futures Forum. Uh, I know there's a few problems with internet in here for people who are on cell phone coverage. At the desk at the front, you'll see a little a very long and boring Wi-Fi password. It's on a little string. It's on a little, little snippet of paper on the desk out the front there. Uh, you can go grab it and type it into your phone. It, it's very long and difficult. If you've got bad eyesight, uh, forget it. Just, you know, don't tweet. It's a good rule for general in life, isn't it? Don't tweet. That's what, that's what I should be thinking about. For our online audience, this is a reminder that if you, if you need to contact our wonderful events team or tech support, navigate to your inbox in the top of your screen and search event support for instant chat. Hello, online people. Hello there. It's good to see you. Uh, right. All right, here we go. All right, now, this is great. We've got... Um, uh, We'll hear in this session, we've got five keynote speakers, all influential voices about raising the ambition on climate change. 
they each have been invited to share a very unique perspective on how the government can negotiate a path through roadblocks that have held back ambition on climate change for over a decade, especially as we approach the COP27 negotiations this November in Egypt. Up first, we hear from Lahans Tubiana. She is the CEO of the European Climate Foundation and a professor at Sciences Po Paris. She previously chaired the Board of Governors of the French Dip Development Agency, as well as the Board of Expertise France. Lahans was a key architect of the landmark Paris Agreement, and she was appointed a UN high-level champion for climate action. All right, let's hear from Lahans. Dear friend of Australia, first of all, welcome back. The new Australian government commitment is to cooperative climate action is so important at that moment in time. A vital reminder that when citizens are clear about the climate crisis and mobilize against it and feel that agency, they can do everything. And every action you have taken has helped get to this point. You have built all these coalitions. You have shaped this popular mandate. So where do we go from here? I'm very pleased to see an enhanced NDC today. It's a very first positive step, especially so early in the new term. But we all have a long way to go in a little time to ramp up. And Australia, too, has a long way to go. And the new NDC is, of course, welcome but remain insufficiently aligned with the 1.5 degree and, its, and with its fair share. So of course, there is good ambition, it's there, energy work happening every day in territories, in your states. You have communities and companies that are showing the way. The urgency means we have to pull every lever, pull up every actor, the only way to meet the Paris goal. And it was meant to be so, could not be government only, has to be every actor. And I think you have all the base to do that and to deliver this now. And I know we have the potential to thrive alongside this renewal leadership uh, of the federal level. In some ways, the challenge ahead of you is more daunting, making this moment count. You are at the end of the last decade for the call to clean transition. Australia has a chance to become a renewable energy superpower in solar manufacturing, in green hydrogen, in green steel and more. How do you get there? I'm sure you're already working hard towards this goal. But let me just conclude with a perspective from abroad. We will be in Egypt in November, a very difficult COP27 ahead. The road to 2050 will take us through many difficult summits and very disorderly processes. This is why the 2050 goal and the roadmap to 2030 are so important. In Europe, the Green Deal is helping us to do that. Australia friends would like to see a whole of Australia, a whole of government plan when that eliminates harmful subsidies that fully embrace a new renewable solution for energy and transport starting now through 2030 and to your 2050 target. Finally, let's acknowledge the multilateral space is deeply strained. We could not have done the Paris Agreement in 2022. But again, no one said even at that time it would be easy. We built climate action on good days and bad days and building on the momentum of the new NDC, COP27 is one of the stage where you can send the signals that will protect climate community. You will be celebrated to be back, but especially in most difficult time, building momentum for emission reduction and find those areas of cooperation and trust to make the world safer and separate, spare us the kinds of impact Australia, France and every region uh, in Africa, in India, uh, everywhere over the planet. Uh, everybody's really already feeling it. At COP, where on top of loss and damage and the adaptation goal, the finance debates program to be prom promised to be very fierce. 
where wealthy countries still fall short of their promise. I hope that Australia will lead the line to offer a new basis of trust, which is the essential item which is lacking at that moment. That means working, working hard towards the 100 billion goal, doubling of adaptation finance, recommitting to its fair contribution to the world's climate finance needs. In this sense, the new NDC from Australia is a powerful clarion call, a milestone to build on. That alone is a reason to be hopeful. And we need new energy in the process. It's very, very evident these days where geopolitics are playing against us, against cooperation and climate action. So let's keep going. And I believe you will deliver that and help us all to go much further. Good luck for your forum. Oh, thank you, Laurence. Oh, so good. Uh, it's so nice to see uh, international recognition for our new status, but also international criticism at the same time, isn't it? It's great. One hand and the other. That was really wonderful to see. And a real good clarion call for all of us, too, to show up as the actors in this fight. That's fantastic. Thank you, Laurence. I'm, I'm G'd up. All right, we now welcome here in Canberra, Dr. Ian Fry. Dr. Ian Fry, UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights in the Context of Climate Change. He continues to teach here part-time at the ANU Fenner School of Environment and Society. Ian uh, worked for the Tuvalu government for over 21 years and was appointed their Ambassador for Climate Change and Environment 2015 to 2019. Dr. Ian Fry, where is he? He's on the screen. Okay, great. He's not here. He's on the screen. I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be at your conference in person. Despite the background behind me, I'm actually on the unceded land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It is very clear that we are faced with a global crisis in the name of climate change. Throughout the world, human rights are being negatively impacted and violated as a consequence of climate change. For many millions, climate change constitutes a serious threat to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy the right to life. Tragically, there remains a huge disparity in effort and a lack of commitment by states who have been the primary historical contributors, contributors of greenhouse gas emissions, leading to the negative impact on the enjoyment of human rights. The negative impacts of failing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is disproportionately felt by persons and communities who are already in disadvantaged situations. In 2019, the world's major CO2 emitters, China, United States, India, the EU plus the United Kingdom, Russia and Japan, together emitted 67% of total fossil CO2. The G20 members account for 78% of emissions over the last decade. Five G20 countries are projected to fall short of their NDC commitments and therefore require further action. They are Australia, Brazil, Canada, the Republic of Korea and the United States. This is despite recent announcement by Australia and the United States. Their actions are simply not enough. Australia cannot continue to feed the world with fossil fuels. The impacts of the lack of action on reducing greenhouse gases can be put in dollar terms. It has been estimated that the United States alone has inflicted more than $1.9 trillion in damage to other countries from the effects of their greenhouse gas emissions. This puts the US ahead of China, currently the world's leading emitter. The estimated costs of the emissions by the United States, China, Russia, India and Brazil total $6 trillion in losses worldwide, or about 11% of 
of annual GDP since 1990. While the costs of climate change are growing dramatically, the global economy is driving in the opposite direction. Studies suggest that subsidies for fossil fuels is estimated to be around 500 billion annually. This has to stop. We cannot afford to subsidise industries that are causing so much damage to the livelihoods of people around the world. Apart from the economic losses, there are some impacts that cannot be easily quantified in monetary terms. For instance, about 3.3 billion people are living in countries with high human vulnerability to climate change. Analysis by the International Federation of the Red Cross found that 97.6 million people were affected by climate and weather-related disasters in 2019. The scale of the problem already being faced by people around the world is staggering. If we drill deeper into these numbers, we find some concerning trends. There is an alarming gender dimension to the impacts of climate change. For instance, in developing countries, girls are more likely to be pulled from school to perform household chores, such as elder care, fetching water and cooking, when households are affected by climate change stresses. Indigenous peoples are right at the forefront of climate change impacts. I met with Indigenous peoples from the Amazon and many other nations throughout the globe. Their rights to the existence must be protected. But these people are not just victims, they are custodians of knowledge on how to manage the planet. It is time we listen to these people. So considering all of this, what can be done? What is the better future we can create to address the climate change emergency that is confronting us? In my report to the UN General Assembly in October, I will be proposing a number of actions. Most of these have come from suggestions based on my consultations with various organisations and individuals. First, we need to urgently ramp up commitments to reduce greenhouse gases. We need to call for a head of state mitigation commitment forum to dramatically enhance commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This could be done as part of the UN Secretary General's Summit of the Future Conference next year. We need to establish an international human rights tribunal to hold accountable governments, business and financial institutions for their ongoing investments in fossil fuels and carbon intensive industries. We need to establish a loss and damage finance facility. I'm suggesting that this could be resolved by the UN General Assembly rather than the COP and that the UN Secretary General establish a consultative group of finance experts to define the modalities and rules for the operation of this fund. We need to create a redress and grievance mechanism to allow vulnerable communities to seek recourse for the damages incurred. For the upcoming COP, I suggest that parties pass an omnibus decision that allows for full and effective participation of Indigenous peoples and civil society organisations in decision-making processes at all levels of the COP process. Youth representatives have called for the COP to establish a Youth Advisory Committee on Loss and Damage. I strongly support this. Indigenous youth must be part of this community. The COP should also establish to revise and dramatically improve the Gender Action Plan. So these are just a few suggestions for action. We must act urgently and realise the climate change emergency that is confronting us. I hope you will use this conference to come forward with further ideas and actions. I wish you all the best in the conference. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Ian. <laughs> Wonderful. Also joining us remotely is Catherine Etock. 
Catherine is a Gairi and Badjula woman of Central Queensland, Australia, and is elected co-chair of the Indigenous Peoples' Organisation, a national coalition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and individuals committed to advocating for the rights of Indigenous peoples. Catherine has also extensive experience at the United Nations, where she led Australian delegations for over a decade. Let's hear from Catherine. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. The, uh had some technical issues. Catherine was cancelled. It's, it's very sad. Um, we'll, um, we'll see if we can get uh, the audio fixed up for Catherine in, uh, in a second. We'll get uh, Uncle Ray up here. Joining us now is Uncle Ray Minicon. Pastor Ray Minicon. Yes, give him a round of applause. One of my favourite speakers from last year. Uncle Ray is an executive member of the Indigenous Peoples' Organisation Australia, director of the Bunji Consultancies, and descendant of the Kabigabi and Gurungurung nations of southeast Queensland. Ray is also a descendant of the South East Islander people with deep and abiding connections to the people of Ambrim Island. Ray works with dozens of organisations as a pastor and educator. And while he was getting his BA in theology at Murdoch University, Ray also set up the Aboriginal Education Unit and Graduate Degree Pro Program in Aboriginal Studies, as well as the first veterinary studies for Aboriginal people at Murdoch University. Fantastic, Ray. Have you got, have you got your gloves? Come on out here. Give it up for Ray. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction. And I don't know what happened to my partner, Cathy. I hope she can come back on again. But she and I share uh, as co-chairs of the Indigenous Peoples' Organisation here in Australia. I'd like to talk to, to you a little bit about Aboriginal education from an Aboriginal perspective. See, before an Aboriginal child reaches the age of 10 or 12, he already has, and she, has a PhD in environmental science. Before they reach the age of 10 or 12, they already have a PhD in marine biology. Before they reach the age of 10 or 12, they already have a degree, a PhD, in astronomy. Because that's how the Aboriginal education system works. And the problem we have is that if you take that Aboriginal child out of the Aboriginal education system, put them in this system, this system calls them a failure. And what we say is, no, it's not the child that's a failure, it's your system. And this, when we come to these kind of challenges, globally as well as locally, this is our problem. It's a systems problem, and still is. And the reasons why an Aboriginal child can have a PhD in astronomy is because we don't teach our children in a classroom with a PowerPoint or a book or from other academic pieces of literature. We teach them out there at night when the stars are out. We don't teach our children how to look after the land or the oceans or the waters through a book. We teach them out there in the land and our elders are there to teach them. 
because our elders are trained and educated in these things because they too have learnt from their ancestors. One of the incredible parts of being an Indigenous person is that we like to walk backwards into the future because we want to know where we come from. We want to know what our ancestors have taught us and what they passed on to us so that we can pass that on to our next generation. I know I was brought up with a lot of this knowledge. I know marine biology. I've lived and worked and played in the rainforests of the Daintree, far north Queensland. I was taught their secrets, not in a book, but by the elders. I know the ways in which our waters run and how they're supposed to work. You know what? Didn't, didn't learn that in a book or in a seminar or even a conference like this. My elders taught me. I was brought up on the other side of 1967 when we had our first refer re referendum to be included in the census and also the little racist stuff that was taken out of Section 51 of the Constitution. So I know what it's like to live under that regime, but also to learn at the foot of my elders. I went to COP26 last year. I just want to say also that as an Aboriginal person, I've lived under 19 Prime Ministers, including this one here. And I have developed, I guess, after 19 years, or those 19 different Prime Ministers, I should say, a way of looking at them through cynicism, because I haven't seen much improvements in my community, as well as in my land in terms of the challenges and the rights that we have put forward to the government time and time and time again. I did go to COP26 last year to, um, in Glasgow. I came away from COP26 utterly disappointed, disillusioned, disgusted and angry. And I'll just give you two reasons. One was the Australian Pavilion. When I went and seen the Australian Pavilion, there was nothing that included Aboriginal people. Number two, that pavilion was propped up and supported by the fossil fuel industry. And they were the ones who were going to tell the world how they were going to solve the climate crisis. And when our Prime Minister went over there, the other fella, the, the ex-fella there, he went under, you know, with a $50 billion sub in one hand, lump of coal in another, and a secret USB in his back pocket. He's going to solve the climate crisis. And I saw this hypocrisy from my own country, from my own leaders. And so I came back disillusioned and disgusted. But there was also one other incident in COP26 that really did was a kick in the gut for me and should be for all Australians. There was a time when all the nations got together for the final vote. And if you have been there, you would have witnessed this, that just 10 minutes or 15 minutes before the final vote, the president of the COP was approached by two nations, China and India. And they wanted the whole of this COP, after two and a half weeks of negotiations in terms of the wording, they wanted the wording changed. And that wording, I think it was in Article 20, they wanted to take out reducing coal to or, or ta re removing coal to uh, downgrading coal. And they got it. The next morning when I watched, uh, I turned on the television over there in, in Scotland, 
on the news there, there was a Queensland politician. When he heard that news, he was in such joy. He said, now we can build more coal mines. How do you think that makes me feel, being a Queenslander, coming from that country? Knowing that in my mother's country there, my, my Gurang people there, is Gladstone. And there's all these coal mines are there. How do you think that makes me feel? And here is all my knowledge that I grew up with is turfed out the door again, shoved to the side. And so I come away from that with all of these really, really, really disillusioned and disappointed things that I see here, particularly in this debate as well. And in this discussion, not only in this room here, but in other places around the world. Yes, we'll be going to COP27. We'll once again be putting our voices there to, the, to all the uh, parties that come there. Yes, we will hope, against all hope, that we might be heard. But here is what I would like to see happen with your support. You see... What we're after as Indigenous peoples is a seat at the table. Consider it this way, that all the nations, including our own, who have been colonised by the nations, they're the ones who sit at the G20s and the G10s, the G7s. They're the ones who direct all of this agendas that they have for the world, they're the ones who say, yes, let's go and take out all the resources, the mineral resources from that country. But an Aboriginal voice, an Indigenous voice, is not at that table. We don't even get a table here. We don't even get a voice in our own country. We've got to wait for a referendum to, to, to give us a voice. How stunningly stupid that is. How do you think it makes me feel? And so as Indigenous peoples, not here and only in this country here, as our former, the, the other guy just said, we are at the forefront of all of this, this climate change business. We don't have a voice. And when the mining company comes in there, who do they listen to? They don't listen to our voice, they listen to the government's voice, who gave them permission to do that. In our own country, in our own country. And so all that knowledge that I learnt at the feet of my ancestors suddenly is meaningless. But to us it's of the most utmost value. We want to participate, but not just only at these conferences. We want a seat at the table. It shouldn't just be the G7. It should be the G12 or the G15. Indigenous voices there saying what they want to say about their own country. Because this is my country. I have a right to say that. I know I've got coal mines up in my country, there in Gladstone there, that are ripping up our earth. We don't have a voice. And so I ask, help us to get there. You know, we've got a United Nations now, the, the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was... Uh, signed off here by one of our ministers here back in 2007. But it's only an aspirational document. How do we make those aspirations real? Not just to our governments, but to all the corporations that live and work in our land and off our land. We've got to learn to do this together. With our indigenous voice, with our knowledge, with our wisdom, we carry that wisdom. It's our most valuable asset. And we're more than willing to share that with you if you're willing to listen and respect us. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. So inspiring. Thanks, Ray. That was terrific. Uh, we've got the audio for Catherine's video sorted out. So let's hear from Catherine Etok.
Thank you, Better Futures, for inviting me to speak here today. I'm disappointed I'm not able to be there in person as I'm a close COVID contact. It's an honour to follow such distinguished speakers. I'm a Gairi and Bachelor woman and co-chair of the Indigenous Peoples Organisation of Australia, which advocates for the rights of First Nations peoples, both nationally and internationally. I'm also the elected Pacific representative to the local communities and Indigenous peoples platform of the UNFCCC, and I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We know the devastating impact of global warming is undeniable, with its effects clearly increasing in severity. I must make mention of the current flooding in Pakistan, causing at least 1,200 deaths and flooding to a third of the country. We've seen fires across Europe and temperatures into the 40s in the UK. We can all also recall the fires in Australia in 2019-2020, which burnt through 14.3 million hectares with 34 people losing their lives. It also destroyed over 3,000 buildings and we now know has damaged the ozone layer. We've also experienced unprecedented flooding in Lismore, where it reached more than 14.4 metres, a full two metres higher than the previous record. We know that Indigenous peoples are particularly vulnerable to the ravages of climate change. In the Torres Strait and Pacific, rising sea levels are inundating homes, contaminating drinking water. Salt is poisoning food plots and erosion in graveyards is leaving the remains of family members exposed and washed away. Many communities are facing forced relocation, but with no framework to support them. While these impacts are horrific, we also know that the change will only get worse. A recent study on Greenland's ice sheet confirmed the sea level rise of 27 centimetres, almost a foot, even if all fossil fuel use was stopped immediately. But this will be 78 centimetres or two and a half feet just from Greenland if we're slower to act. While the uh, collapse of the East Antarctic ice sheet, if, we're, if we fail to move it soon enough, will increase sea levels by a catastrophic five metres. So this is a critical decade where we need to take significant action to avoid dire consequences and worsening extreme weather events. Global inaction must be addressed. We need collaborative justice-based solutions and structural changes to ensure countries meet their Paris agreements, not by playing with carbon offsets, but by taking real and substantive action. We know that 80% of the world's biodiversity is being protected by Indigenous peoples, while only making up 4% of the global population. Yet Indigenous peoples and those of the Pacific region and local communities in Bangladesh and the African continent and elsewhere remain most at threat. So the IPO is assisting First Nations peoples from the Pacific region and globally to raise their voices at COP27. We have identified 24 First Nations peoples from across the Pacific region to speak on the urgent need for action at COP. These include the First Nations peoples from Australia, including the Naju and Murning elder, Les Schultz from Western Australia, who will speak about the rights of traditional owners to protect their culture and cultural heritage in the face of a massive hydrogen project and associated wind farm planned on his traditional country. We also have Joshua, Joshua Garinge, who is defending the Great Artesian Basin from fracking and the associated contamination. And we also have Adrian Biragaba, who will outline how his native title was extinguished for the huge Adani coal mine. We also have multiple speakers from across the Pacific region. We have a woman environmental defender from PNG, 
who has campaigned against a mine. She heads a women and girls organisation with 4,800 members, all impacted by the mine, its waste tailings, and the contaminants of heavy metals into the river flow. We have a speaker from Vanuatu who will outline the advisory opinion sought through the International Court of Justice on the obligation of nations to protect the rights of present and future generations from the harms of climate change. This action is building momentum with the Pacific Islands Summit recently securing its endorsement, which included Australia and New Zealand. We also have experts on loss and damage among Pacific Island states and specialists on nature-based and urban adaptation solutions and many other environmental defenders. But in addition to this, we're also supporting 18 people internationally with Indigenous climate speakers from Nigeria, Tanzania, Kenya, Burundi, India, the Philippines, Guatemala and Ecuador. This includes a Maasai environmental defender who is campaigning against the Maasai being dispossessed by the Tanzanian government to establish a large national park, which I understand will be used for lion hunting. COP attendees will also have the opportunity to learn from the Ogoni people who confronted Shell and organised non-violent confrontations that have stopped oil extraction on their lands. We also have Indigenous peoples from India who will speak about the need to strengthen accountability of climate financing mechanisms and the Green Climate Fund to avoid fostering harmful climate solutions, such as the planned large dam that will flood their Indigenous lands. It is critical Indigenous peoples have a strong voice at COP27 and beyond. So the IPO has worked with NGOs here in Australia to fund Pacific participants to attend COP in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. A climate justice pavilion is financially supporting those from Africa and other regions. After raising funds, we now find we're having great difficulty in securing badges that give access to the COP venue. Apparently, the number of badges for civil society is less than half of that previously provided at COP26 in Glasgow. For Indigenous peoples, this has been particularly problematic. While we expect to receive government badges from Australia, and a number of government badges from the Pacific nations. And we have three badges from CANA and three from PECAN, CANA's equivalent in the Pacific. Unfortunately, we still need more. So if there's any of you that can assist or draw on your global networks for badges, please reach out through Better Futures. We need strong Indigenous voices at COP27 to demand real and significant action. We need to implement Ian Fry's recommendations for a legally binding mechanism to require governments and industries to disclose fossil fuel subsidies and investments. His recommendations to include ecocide as an indictable offence at the International Criminal Court must be enacted. His proposal to establish a human rights tribunal to hold governments, corporations and financial institutions accountable is also crucial. I encourage you to read his report and his many recommendations in full. Those recommendations, if enacted, will encourage nations to take real action to avert the worst of the climate calamity we're currently facing. Thank you for your time today. Terrific. Thank you, Catherine. Such great, important voices in that last session. Excellent. Well, we're about to um, go head into another panel. Uh, we're going to be joined by six outstanding guests who will be discussing policy and action to decarbonise sectors and create better outcomes for all Australians. Now, if you are 
online. Don't forget to shoot us your questions in the question tab. We'll be extra diligent about sharing them on stage this time round. Sorry, we forgot the first time round. Um, and for our people in the crowd, also make sure you raise your hand. We'll get a microphone out to you and try and wait for the microphone before uh, speaking. All right, moderating this panel is Claire O'Rourke. She is an author, environmentalist and advocate with more than two decades of working in journalism and communications and campaigns across Australia and around the world. Claire helps others take action on climate change currently as the Australian Energy Transformation Program co-director at the Sunrise Project. And this is her first book, Together We Can. Oh, look at it, so good. Come up here, Claire. Come and tell us about this book. This book will teach you how to build hope into your everyday thinking. Isn't that great? So, you can actually buy a copy of this book out in the foyer uh, before 4.30. Make sure you do that. Uh, how did you go writing this book, Claire? Well, lockdown helps. <laughs> and um, also it helps that there's so many people doing amazing things. All right, take Let's it away, Claire. That. Thanks, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on unceded Ngunnawal country today and I would just like to thank Ray and Catherine for their wonderful words of solidarity and resistance and the ongoing, ongoing work that they'll be doing with our um, support. Um, I'd like to pay deep respects to Elders past and present and to any First Nations people who are here today and online and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm going to take you back to early 2021 when I was surprisingly in a Zoom meeting um, with colleagues, climate advocacy experts, and we were listening to climate counsellor and eminent Professor Will Steffen, who was delivering some pretty shocking news. Professor Steffen guided us through evidence that strongly suggests global average temperatures will exceed 1.5 degrees in the next decade, delivering untold damage to the critical ecosystems we all depend on for life wasn't a cheery call. And Professor Stefan, as many of you will know well, is an expert on tipping points. And when he was asked the inevitable question about the cascading effects in our planetary systems that can be triggered by this crisis we're in, his answer was really quite unexpected. He said, I'm optimistic because we know that society can create tipping points and that's why the work you're doing is so important. So these words jolted me out of my more usual sense of creeping dread that I get on those types of calls and filled me with some much needed motivation. It sparked for me a search for signs of progress, for reasons to be hopeful and to discover action that can create the positive tipping points we need this de decade. So I took a few minutes looking up from my doom scrolling device, I can see lots of you have got yours with you now, and I found so much positive climate action happening all over Australia, I struggled to fit the examples into the book. I met the marine biologist in WA who is inventing a new bioplastic that can break down completely in the ocean, made with freshwater and seawater to boot. The fund managers who are guiding billions of dollars into making credible climate-friendly investments and the Hunter Jobs Alliance, a collaboration of unionists and conservationists who are here today and who are working together as industry in the region shifts away from fossil fuels. And I met Alan, the retired engineer, who is building fire resilience, working with the scouts and with his neighbours. They're replanting the rainforest on Gundagar country in the Blue Mountains. So these efforts might all seem incremental or too small or too disparate. But when we think about systemic change, we need to consider how we are creating the conditions across the system that can allow these positive tipping points to occur. We need to look at how we're leveraging our networks, how we are influencing our decision makers, and how we are ensuring the work that we are doing is meaningful for people to participate in. The decisions we make, sometimes daily, all add up. So eventually, the system will tip in the way that we need it to. And the infuriating thing about tipping points, positive or otherwise, is that we can't see them until they're in the rearview mirror. And humans have this really uncanny ability to underestimate what it's possible to achieve. Here's a couple of examples from the energy world. Back in 2014, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicted that solar, wind and geothermal energy could provide only 4% of the world's energy by 2100. 
We're on track to reach this by around 2030, 70 years ahead of that predict prediction. Not seven, 70. In 2014, the International Energy Agency predicted average solar prices would be five cents US a kilowatt hour by 2050. But guess when that happened? It was only six years after that prediction, all the way back in 2020. Now, as we meet this week, one third of Pakistan is underwater. More than 1,300 people have died. Millions are displaced. Europe has experienced record-breaking summer heat, and we've heard about the devastating wildfires there and in California today. This year at home, communities in the regions and in cities are working through the results of multiple flooding events. Families remain without permanent homes, almost three years on from the black summer fires. And the turbulence in the energy sector is contributing to a cost of living crisis that most impacts people who can least afford it. We're living in unprecedented times, so much so that the word itself risks becoming some kind of wretched cliche. It's up to us to ensure decision makers are preparing and supporting communities as our economy and society makes this fundamental shift to what I hope is a more radically inclusive, connected and healthier world that's unshackled from polluting fossil fuels. This is possible. And that's why today we're privileged to be joined by people who are making an outsized difference to our buildings and cities, through the law, in finance and industry, and in our communities too. So today we're joined by this wonderful group of experts, but before I invite the panel to the stage for a conversation, we're going to hear from Scientia Professor Dio Prasad from UNSW Sydney. Now, Professor Prasad is the Interim Executive Director of the Australian Trailblazer for Recycling and Clean Energy, and in his spare time, he's CEO of the New South Wales Government Decarbonisation Innovation Hub. He's an international authority and recognised as a national leader in the field of sustainable buildings and cities, and is among the leading advocates for sustainability in Australia, with his contributions widely acknowledged at all levels of government and professions in Australia. Please welcome Professor Dio Prasad. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, so I'm talking about innovation. A number of speakers have mentioned uh, the need for innovation uh, underpinned by good research, finding its way all the way to commercialization uh, and markets, uh, both in Australia and abroad, uh, creating products and, and, and technologies that deal with decarbonization uh, at scale uh, is clear part of the solution uh, in terms of making the case for the change towards a, a, a more climate-friendly uh, uh, future. As, as an academic researcher, I guess I have to use PowerPoints. Uh, <laughs> we have been trained to do that, so, so I will stick with that, and I'm supposed to point at somebody up there uh, to, to change things as we go. Uh, so, so the trailblazer, I'll talk about two, two research uh, things that we, we have that uh, provide some promise in terms of our ability to commercialize what we are doing in Australia uh, in, in the area of decarbonization. Uh, first one is the Australian trailblazer, you know the national manufacturing priorities and one of them is recycling and clean energy. And we managed to get the big grant, uh, the total of up around $200 million, to try and effect change within, uh, I initially within a four-year time frame, and, and explore how it can become a feature of future uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, so uh, this particular trailblazer, uh, when, when you look at commercialization, one of the reasons why it's not happening effectively, uh, people point towards what's called the value of research. So, so there are not enough incentives for, for leading researchers to take their research all the way to product and market. Uh, after a certain point, uh, they get more incentives to, to, to go for the new project and publish two more papers and get promoted and so forth, but also how IP is dealt with, uh, and, and uh, this is at all universities uh, in, in Australia, uh, generally. And, and how do we uh, run a whole range of culture change 
uh, initiatives that look at this whole process of how we hire people, how we incentivize them, how we give them the, the opportunity to take product, uh, all uh, the research outcomes all the way to market. Uh, so, and, and, and also do things like building national capacity to a level that can underpin this whole process of commercialization. So it's a commercialization focus, but it looks at culture change and, and enabling activities that allow you to uh, take products to market, including uh, finding the right funding and support. Industry normally comes in very late in the day uh, when they can see a, a, a sight line from a, a advanced research uh, at a technology readiness level, TRL, uh, to, to market. But before then, and after the discovery research is done, there is this valley uh, which, which we're trying to navigate uh, using the. So, so we, we put together a large uh, proposal which we were successful with, uh, and, and PricewaterhouseCoopers tells us that it's capable of producing more than 5,000 jobs and $15 billion in, in, in economic impacts while reducing, uh, uh, taking away about 180 megatons uh, of, of carbon from the system. So, so it's serving the right sort of purpose. Uh, next, thanks. Uh, we at universities, and in particular our two universities, uh, UNSW and Newcastle, who are partners in this, uh, have uh, in our system, if you like, post-research, uh, a pipeline of technologies already present, 44%. Uh, of uh, that opportunity nationally sits at these two universities in terms of uh, high TRL technology, uh, 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 technologies that, that can go all the way. And we have a whole bunch of national research, international quality research centers, uh, which can be used to enable that. So, so, so uh, there is not an infrastructure problem. Uh, again, thanks. Uh, so, so when you look at early TRL, the, the lower red ones, the idea is to take them much further up. So, so we may, in a four-year lifespan, take some of these from level TRL 3, which is just past proof of concept, uh, further up to TRL 6 or 7, which is when industry starts to look at the opportunity for a product at the other end and, and, and the market. Uh, but there are other products in our pipeline which are much more advanced, TRL 7, 8, and so forth. And we, have, uh, we are developing uh, detailed development plans and commercialization plans for those to go to market. And, and, and uh, the, the uh, opportunity for these, within four years, there would be a whole series of products uh, in the market. They include things like biofuels for aviation. Uh, they, they include solar products, new generation solar products, which, uh, which are uh, printed solar, for example. Uh, these are very much at the, at the top end of TRLs and ready to go out. And micro factories for recycling products in regional areas of Australia. So, so there are lots of products opportunities that we have mapped out. Next, thanks. Uh, so, so, I mentioned a whole lot of uh, culture change and enabling activities are required because uh, they are the, some of the causes why uh, so many products sit or get taken abroad and commercialized elsewhere instead of locally in Australia. Uh, we are looking at a whole bunch of innovation rewards, uh, technology translation squads, having people ready who can be mobilized on quick notice to help SMEs to, to, to look at the problem in hand in terms of product development and, and upscaling uh, at, a, at a factory level. Uh, we even have va innovation vouchers that enable that uh, to, to cover some of the early costs. But it's integrated in a way that the innovation vouchers and a squad of people who are trained to uh, help will help the SMEs take it all the way. Research translation, we have prototyping workshops where we develop, uh, help industry develop prototypes and, and, and also accelerator units uh, which enable uh, that process to move, move forward. National manufacturing precincts and, and uh, etc. are also part of that uh, package to, to enable uh, the research to move forward. 
critical skills area, this is clearly uh, a highly, highly uh, desired uh, outcome from the, from the hub. And, and we, we want to make sure that all the skills, we have PhDs who are industry placed, so that they work with industry on their problems and as a result are familiar and can continue to work in industry to, take, uh, to build the products further. We have fellowships uh, who are postdoctoral uh, people uh, who will be deployed in industry and work under uh, university supervision to enable that process to, to, to be easier for the, for the prospective manufacturing partner, for example. Next, thanks. Uh, and, and, and we have already uh, flagged a whole lot of uh, locations around Australia, and many of them are regional ones, because job creation in some of these areas, in regional areas, is of critical importance. Eh? So, so we have mapped a whole lot of areas in New South Wales and around Australia where we will be trialing, testing, demonstrating, and, and taking to market so that some of the job creation stays within the regions. Thanks. And, and uh, the, the challenge at the moment for this particular hub is that in four years, with such massive funding uh, availability, we want to, we're basically looking at a decade worth of change in four years. And, and at the other end, we, we hope that uh, we will be able to deliver uh, on, on some big ambi ambitions about economic impact and, and, and greenhouse emissions and so forth. Thanks. Uh, the other project that we have got uh, is the New South Wales Government's Decarbonisation Innovation Hub. You probably heard of some of the decarbonisation uh, plans uh, in New South Wales. Uh, the Treasurer, Matt Keane, has, has uh, been very active and looking at 50% reductions in New South Wales. And, but the, the challenge is to do that while creating economic uh, opportunity uh, within New South Wales. Thank you. Uh, so they funded us to, to run a hub and a network, which is a different structure, uh, and, and I'm running the overall hub. But inside of that, there are three areas we have started with, three large networks. One is in electrification and energy systems to look at pipeline uh, technology uh, areas that can go all the way. Working with industry partners, we have about 80 industry partners we are talking across for different technologies uh, that, that we are developing. So energy and electrification, uh, power fuels and hydrogen. So that's, that's a number of speakers have mentioned that, green hydrogen and so forth. But not only those, but balance of systems, storage, transportation, and, and, and in, in some of the areas like uh, photovoltaics, this huge other componentry that we can look at in terms of commercializing in Australia so that we have the economic base here uh, as a result of a lot of these. And land and primary industries, agriculture, for example, is a uh, well-known area. Uh, and, and we want to work with those and the other networks which have cross-cutting integrated uh, integration opportunities for demonstrating, developing solutions that might work better in regional areas, for example. And, and after these three, three more are flagged, built environment, transport, and, and uh, uh, water uh, as three areas where we are going to start mapping products that can go all the way uh, and, and as a result have major economic impact uh, within, within the country. So these are the two big things we are working on and, and having listened to so many great speakers about different perspectives uh, on, on substitution or moving forward towards decarbonization. Our role we see as decarbonizing at scale while making sure that the economic impacts uh, are, uh, are uh, the outcome that stay in Australia for future uh, good of, uh, of the country. So thank you and uh, we'll probably talk a bit more on other things. Thank you. Well, if you thought you were busy, meet Professor Prasad. Um, I'd like to invite the rest of our panel members to the stage now and online. I think we have one of our participants. Um, and I'll introduce you all as you come. So please do come up, fellow panellists. I'd first like to introduce you to Dr Virginia Marshall, Wiradjuri Nyemba Yinar, 
Um, Dr. Marshall is a principal solicitor and director in her law firm Triple BL Legal and is the inaugural Indigenous Postdoctoral Fellow at the Australian National University with the School of Regulation and Global Governance and Fenna School. Virginia is, lead, is the leading legal scholar on Indigenous Australian water rights and is co-chair of the Indigenous Cluster to the Institute of Climate Change, Energy and Disaster Solutions at ANU. Author of an award-winning book that you can also buy in the foyer, Overturning Aquanullius. Um, Virginia is the water expert for the World Economic Forum. She was a UN Pacific delegate to COP26 for local communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform meetings and a co-drafter of the Universal Periodic Review Australia's report card and is an executive board member of the Indigenous Peoples Organisation Australia. Among her many accolades, Virginia was recognised by the University of Victoria as a distinguished women, woman scholar and was a national winner of the IATSA's WEH Stanner Prize for Best Indigenous Thesis. Please welcome Virginia. <laughs> Michael Wheatland is an internationally chartered engineer turned manager who is passionate about sustainable outcomes through carbon reduction technology, infrastructure management and clean energy projects. As the Sustainable Processing Business Manager at Calix, Michael is responsible for the commercial, technical and business development of new and innovative applications of the Calix technology around the world. We'll hear more about that in a minute. Michael currently has projects running across just three continents, which are creating more sustainable outcomes for existing industry and creating new technology to improve efficiency of existing extraction processes. Michael has in successfully implemented multi-million dollar projects with Rio Tinto, BHP, Alcoa, and now with Calix. Please welcome Michael. Um, Liz Melena Terrier is the CEO of Carbon Positive Australia. She loves to empower everyone to minimise their impact on the environment and passionate about a sustainable, regenerative future. Louise is, the, is an FCCA accountant with a Masters in Creativity and Innovation. Sounds fun. Um, prior to working with Carbon Positive Australia, Louise worked to fund more than 10 million tropical trees with the UK charity Tree Sisters. Louise believes that our personal values, when combined with a strong business strategy, can have a huge social and environmental impact, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and I believe online we have Akash Sakdeva. Uh, welcome, Akash. It's great to see you on the line. Um, Akash has more than 10 years' experience in the delivery of responsible investment, joining superannuation fund Hester in 2018 as senior responsible investment advisor to support the implementation of Hester's leading responsible investment strategy, including climate change strategy and active ownership programs. Prior to Hester, Akash was an environmental, social and governance analyst for Regnan, a global leader in long-term value systemic risk analysis and responsible investment advisory. Akash has worked with the Monash Sustainability Institute and holds a Master's of Corporate Sustainability from the university. Please welcome Akash Sakdeva. All right. We got a mic? Can you hear me okay? What about now? All right, so thank you, panellists. Um, so we might start with you, Dio. You have a book coming out as well soon. Um, it's about the race to 2030 for buildings, which is 40% of the carbon problem in Australia. So what are the top three policy recommendations that Australian governments should consider to help with building, the building and construction sector? Thank you. So, is it working? Yeah. <laughs> um, when we look at uh, the market for buildings uh, nationally, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that can be done that are the market pull side, education and, 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 and uh, making information available, what to do, how to do, and all of those. But more so than that, I guess, uh, from a government point of view, the intervention could be at, at the level of one of the main levers they have, which is the building code of Australia. Uh, and, and that can be used. Normally, it's used to eliminate worst practice, but it can be used to drive much better practice than we have in building and construction. So uh, net zero has been talked about. My research center uh, previously 
looked at a trajectory for lower net zero carbon uh, over a 10 year period. We funded a research that was then submitted to the government. Uh, they did their own research and they've gone towards a trajectory approach. But it is still, uh, like last week they announced that uh, they would push uh, six star homes to seven star requirements, for example. Uh, that uh, has about 24% or so reduction uh, uh, potential in emissions. But you've got to have a sight line uh, in terms of net zero. Uh, if you have 43% commitment by 2030 and 20 net zero by 2050, then, then what uh, levels of stringency in the code will deliver those. I think working back then, uh, a lot more stringent code uh, would be needed. So, so the last week, seven star in housing, but there are many other building types is one uh, sort of uh, jump, but a lot more uh, needs to be done and that would be part of a change process, I think. Uh, that's uh, the first one. Uh, then you look at the existing buildings now. Uh, we need to incentivize refurbishments and changes or retrofits uh, that uh, improve uh, performance of existing buildings. Otherwise, they are the large numbers sitting there with very inefficient systems and design and so forth. So in incentivization there is important. The third one, I guess, uh, is in government's hands, all the government buildings that they are owning or leasing uh, they can set goals for themselves as, as, a, as a pace setter uh, to show that they can drive it to net zero. In my uh, uh, Australian guideline that I published uh, on net zero 2030, uh, we found that for new, new buildings, we can get that by 2030 cost effectively. Uh, but um, uh, considering the embedded carbon and whole of life approach is very important because by 2030, embedded carbon in building materials will be the larger of the, of the uh, percentages, of, if you like. So uh, incentivizing new products uh, and, and innovation in, in, in the products and technology side that reduce embedded carbon is, is a major one, uh, I think, in the medium to long term. I think you're highlighting here that it's not only important to get on with it very quickly, but the, I think you're talking to the... This is the security control room. We have an interloper. Um, but I think um, what Dio is highlighting here is the really critical role that research plays in influencing policy and ensuring that we get those policy settings right. So, Virginia, if I could turn to you, um, you're part of a collaborative community of climate-related researchers and teachers, and how do you find yourself connecting with governments, business and the community in your work to inform Australia's climate change response? Um, well, I think the most important thing I have to start with is acknowledging my elders, um, past and present, and also that we're on unceded sovereign country. And uh, I think that the most important issues that we've been talking about today, and Uncle Ray has really put it quite well, is that there's a Western education and there's an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander education, Indigenous education. So all of our institutions and some of the work that, that you've also discussed is really important, but it also has to be culturally safe. And it also has to be a, a really um, in, uh, enthusiastic, but also a very supportive system for Indigenous-led research. And that's one of the areas that I'm actually leading, which is the Australian Research Council um, uh, grant on Indigenous medicines. And again, um, ensuring that our community members, our cultural bosses, our uh, leaders have a very important role in that research. So it's a very different uh, example, a very different model that you are actually outlining. Um, this is really in line with research that takes into account, as AETSA says, uh, a code of ethics guidelines that meets the timeline. So in other words, there are some projects by industry or governments that have time frame, uh, but however, we have to have an Indigenous time frame as well for communities to actually consult with each other and also uh, ensure that when moving forward, it, the capacity of 
individual and collective uh, members then have that opportunity. So whatever research is actually being undertaken here in Australia, um, we need to be very um, aware that all of that collaborative work can only happen if uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are really not only in the room and at the table, uh, going to courses such as the ones that you've outlined. And uh, as um, Special Rapporteur Ian Fry had said, um, human rights really aren't abstract concepts. Uh, they're things that we should be doing daily. And those uh, human rights need to be embedded, not only in the climate change area, but the research that I'm doing, and, and also engaging with governments to uh, just produce different results, better results, more um, effective a collaboration. I think that's really important because when you walk into the room, like many of us here, uh, we all have individual expectations uh, and we have collective expectations about how we want to go forward with climate change. Uh, we know that uh, the, the carbon price for um, many Indigenous land councils is far too low. Um, I've just come away from a remote area and insurance for Indigenous um, rangers to actually exercise uh, their incredible ability to uh, look after land, water, etc., is hindering Indigenous land councils. So there are a lot of uh, issues that have, haven't even been talked about today that really affect the operation of not only economic livelihoods, but that livelihood is a well-being. And we know that after two years of COVID, that many of us have, have had to um, rethink our relationships, um, where we go to work, why we go to work every day, in the train, when we're sick, uh, when we're tired. So working from home has really energised us and, and also created problems for some people that don't want to be in that space. Um, and then homeschooling and all of that other mix. So I think um, really being very thoughtful about those issues um, in this area is really important. So research has to take on a very organic, but it's still led, but an organic um, process that really understands that a lot of the issues that we want as a peoples uh, are different from uh, many of the examples you've heard today. Manangua. Thank you. And I think when we talk about a principled approach, it can be meaningless unless we're talking real practical action and um, putting that into like real terms in real places. And we've got quite a broad ranging discussion today. So we're gonna motor on over to Akash. And um, Akash, there's been a lot of talk about climate action. Um, and we note the announcement today that Hester's made about putting um, large polluting companies on the, on the watch list. But could you say more about how asset owners like Hester can move from talk and the principled approach to putting money on the table to really drive action? Yeah, thanks to everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm dialing in today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'll start with a little bit, bit of a background to Hester, just to, to set some context for the question. So Hester is an industry super fund, mainly for workers in the health and community services sector. We manage the retirement savings of 950,000 Australians with $68 million of assets under management. <coughs> Excuse me. As a large and diversified asset owner, um, Hester is ex exposed to long-term climate related risk and regardless of whether assets are in our portfolio or not, because they affect the entire system, climate change affects the entire system. Um, and our research and our scenario analysis through that, we've sort of found, in our view, that the members' best financial interest is to serve through a timely, equitable and orderly transition to net zero emissions by 2050. So with that in mind, in 2020, we committed, uh, declared our ambition to reach net zero carbon emissions across our investment portfolio by 2050. Uh, and we've recently, so good timing this morning, we also just increased our in terms of 2030 emissions reduction target to 50% reduction in normalised um, emissions. And this all provides the basis for us to think about how to allocate capital into the transition. Um, and I'll, I'll call out some of the good work that was done by the IPCC, the Working Group 3 report, which really honed in on the climate financing gap is, is such an important part of how we respond. Um, and in summary, it has to use us three tools um, through which we implement our approach. So the first one is obviously capital allocation, the second one is our active ownership approach, 
and the third one is through advocacy. So when it comes to capital allocation, we've been working on integrating, incorporating climate change into our investment process from top to bottom. And so through investment strategy, the risk framework, stress testing, down into how we select managers, how we select companies, uh, and then even in our reporting. So a particular thing that I'd like to call out is one of the targets we announced this morning, which is that we've just announced uh, a target to have 10% of the portfolio will be invested in climate solutions opportunities by 2030. So we're measuring progress through this annually, through investments which are aligned to the sustainable development goals, in particular number seven, number 13, and also 11.3, which are focused on renewable energy and sustainable property. And we're using a methodology developed by the Sustainable Development Investment Asset Owner Platform. Sorry, that's a long one, so SDI AOP. Uh, and, and the reason for this, and you know, an important aspect coming back to the broader question is what helps us to be able to invest is actually having the right taxonomies, having the right data, being able to show evidence for what we're doing is really, really valuable. And that'll be reported on regularly. What we found is that to achieve the targets, the biggest change will come from the infrastructure asset class um, through deployment of renewable energy. And we also see in international equities, we expect some, I guess you call it greening of the benchmarks as the, the nature of the global economy shifts over time. Although this is not expected to be linear. The second tool or pillar of our approach is active ownership. So our approach to climate risk and opportunities is centered on the belief that engagement to influence investing companies to participate in the transition is in our members' best financial interest. Uh, we engage directly, we engage in collaboration with other investors through initiatives like Climate Action 100 Plus and also through managers and service providers. What we've seen over time is that engagement, both direct and collective, has been influential in achieving change. In particular, I can call out across the ASX, you can see an increasing number of companies that have committed to net zero and set goals to reduce carbon emissions. But then what the Climate Action 100 Plus benchmark, which is publicly available, shows you, it, this is a clear gap when it comes to companies setting targets and then companies actually allocating capital towards the transition. And so a lot of the focus of our engagement plans with companies is looking for transition plans that identify and quantify emissions reduction and capital investment that shifts companies and business models towards a low carbon future. As Claire mentioned, what we flagged this morning is exactly that, looking for these companies which are really large emitters in Australia to, to allocate capital in a way which actually supports them and us to all achieve our goals. The third pillar is advocacy. And this is important just in recognising that climate change is a systemic risk. And so our actions as an investor or as an owner of shares don't exist in the vacuum. I think you know the last decade in Australia is a first-hand example of the importance of the right policy settings. And over our advocacy approach, we've sort of we've previously called for a couple of different things. One in particular is thinking about how to remove barriers to investment. Uh, you know, we were an early investor in renewables and clean technologies, and we have first-hand experience seeing the sort of barriers investors face in deploying long-term capital. And what we found is that these barriers mean investors have focused their capital in other countries. So an example statistic from us is we've got three times as much invested in renewables globally as we do domestically. And what we've seen is that where there's policy support and there's a robust regime underlying that policy support, this allows for investors to, to have long-term contracts, long-term certainty, and to really put their money into the market. The other element is is, I guess, things that can be done within um, the business as usual of investing, but the scale of the climate challenge means there's also a, a huge need for innovation in how we think about things. And so I'll call out a particular example where we engage with the government about innovative partnerships and structures. Um, and th this was in 2020, we, we um, put in a submission to the then federal government about models for investing alongside private investors. And the example we used was we have an investment in what's called a biomedical translation fund. And that's designed to catalyze commercialization of biomedical research. So as part of that fund, so it's called a BTF, the federal government offers a dollar matching program for institutional investors. But basically what it means is for every dollar we put in, the government also puts in a dollar. And this has been a really successful um, 
project. And so then we put in the submission talking about the BPF. And then in 2021, some of you might be aware the then government then announced the establishment of the Low Emissions Technology Commercialization Fund. So again, really long wordy things, but this fund is um, half a billion dollars of new money through CEFC. And again, using a similar one-to-one -one dollar matching approach, every dollar of government money matches a dollar of private money. Um, just a small example, but a way in which we're picking up innovation from other areas and thinking how we can apply it to um, allocating capital into climate change. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Akash. So I think what we're touching on here is the nexus between um, policy, investment and technology. So if I could turn to you, Michael. Your, um, Calix, your company's slogan is Mars is for quitters, and I just love that. It is, yep. But can there's, you... there's only one Earth, so <laughs> got to stay um, here. Well, that's certainly what I plan to say. So can you share some insights to the current processes organisations are going through to develop technology solutions in Australia? Any advice out there for people who are looking to develop and commercialise their ideas and start making their own outsized impact? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I suppose, um, I mean, we've heard from the Chief Minister this morning, as well as Akash, um, about allocation of capital funds and things like that. And I suppose what I was wanting to highlight is that, is that these decisions are not made in a vacuum. Uh, go government policy really does drive uh, where the capital allocation is going, uh, what ideas get up, what technologies have a, have a chance to actually succeed through that commercialisation process. Um, and these decisions are largely made at the board level because private investment is, as we heard this morning from the Chief Minister, private investment is the, the big driver in industry in terms of improving, um, imp well, giving those, giving those technologies a chance to succeed. Also through, through investment, co-investment from the government is also a huge thing. Um, now, I mean, boards, the, the people who are making these decisions, largely company boards, they, they've got a fiduciary responsibility, um, which means that they, they can't invest in something that doesn't make any sense financially, right? So it is the government's responsibility to set the to set up economy, set up rules and regulations of our system in order to drive investment in these spaces. Um, now, I mean, we're, that's why we're here. We're here to talk about the ideas and innovations that we can, we can put in place in terms of policy to, to really uh, make sure that these companies can invest, um, make sure that private, private people who are, you know, whether it's on the stock market or angel investors can come in and invest in these technologies. Um, and, and these projects, th so these, these, these investments are largely done on a project by project basis. So um, somebody, it, it's, it's somebody in this audience could come up with an, an amazing idea for an, for an innovative technology. Um, and then it takes, it takes people to get around a table. It takes, it takes trust. It, 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 it takes building a network of people that, that you can trust and share your idea with so that um, you know that it's not going to you know, disappear and people are going to steal the IP and all that type of stuff. But um, it, it requires you to build trust, build a network of people, um, and, and re really make sure that those ideas are, uh, are really clear and, and um, well understood. Because sustainability uh, and climate change are incredibly complex topics to talk about. I mean, I mean something as simple as you know, a plastic straw you know, I mean, it's, you know, people say it's bad because they saw, you know, it pollutes the ocean, but are paper straws any better? You know, there, there's no, like, real clear-cut answer to these questions. Um, and because of that, it, it, it is really important to have clarity of idea uh, when you're establishing a project, making sure you've got pinpoint focus on, on uh, the topic and the, the reason that, you're, that the idea is going to work, um, and, a, and a very clear idea about how, you can, how that can be commercialised and the only way you, you actually develop all of these things to a well-rounded out idea, um, as Dio was saying about the TRL level, the technology readiness level, is by talking with people, is by getting around a table, by speaking with researchers, by speaking with economists, by speaking with investors, um, to, to make sure that the idea makes sense from, from an economic perspective, making sure that the, the correct regulations are in government. Um, because the the... the it is really important in terms of investing in these things that the companies have, or the, the people investing have confidence that it's going to work in the long term. There's, there's no point having 
um, you know, short-term incentives that you know, give people, it might be even a multi-million dollar grant to get a project up, that in five years' time, if there's a change in government and a change in policy, that, um, that, that project may fall on its face because the, the economics have changed and gas has got a lot cheaper or, or renewables are unable to pump electricity into the grid because of just regulatory, regulatory changes in the, uh, in the industry. So making sure that we've got um, essentially everyone on board politically across the, the spectrum um, and confidence that the, the, the economic settings are not going to change over time is really important in terms of making sure that, that companies or uh, super and farms uh, or, or other people around the world are in, uh, have the confidence to be able to invest in these technologies. So I suppose that's, that's kind of the long and short of it. But any, anyone with a good idea can, can come forward and get up with these... Uh, with, the, with these ideas and projects, um, but it does take good communication and, and collaboration as well as trust to make sure that, that we, can, we can really progress these to a, a high technology readiness level and then commercialise it. And there's a lot of roadblocks in the way, but um, it's, I mean, as you can see from, from Calix, we've, we've gone from a startup company 10 years to rolling out our technology around the world. We've, we've got um, new new factory in Belgium and one being built in, in Western Australia for lithium processing at the moment. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, um, there's and some... That's and that's powered by renewables as well. It is, yeah. Yeah, so the, the idea is... I suppose the idea with our technology is that we, we, are, we can essentially replace most minerals processing facilities that, that currently burn fossil fuels, whether it's coal or gas in China, with a renewably powered electrically driven calciner, or it's a thermal treatment process here in Australia. That way you don't need to transport all the rock, the waste rock over to China. Um, and we get a boost to our economy here because we produce uh, really high value items like metals or lithium uh, that goes into batteries. Uh, and that, all, that also, I suppose, the other thing to say is that by developing these ideas here and making sure we're building the industry in Australia, it opens the opportunities up for, uh, you know, if we're producing lithium in Australia, you know, we can open up, open up a batteries hub. We're making, we're manufacturing batteries in Australia, or um, you know, rare earth magnet supply chains, or um, green cement. As you talked about building products, you know, making sure that we've got the regulatory uh, responses in for, for green building products that can actually absorb carbon. You know, there's a lot of things that the government can do to to assist and make sure that the policy settings are, are right for these investments to succeed. I think in this increasingly volatile world both you know, economically and environmentally and socially, we're going to need deep relationships and partnerships and authentic collaboration to succeed. Um, and so, Louise, could I invite you to reflect on what you've witnessed through your work that demonstrates the willingness of organisations, governments and others to work in partnership towards a more sustainable and more regenerative future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so back in August of 2020, we did a project called Carbon Care, which was sponsored by um, Lottery West. And it was a chance to kind of go out and ask organisations, um, broad acre farmers, just a wide group of people, you know, what, what did they actually think about the climate? What actions were they actually taking? And we were relatively surprised by the results, actually, because at that time we thought, you know, there must be already sort of pressure coming down the supply chain, customers giving pressure to actually take action. And what we found was quite interesting, that it was actually employees in the organisation who were the main drivers of change. So whether that was the management, the board of directors, or whether that was just ordinary people working in the organisation, they were the ones that were, you know, driving the change and actually wanting their organisations to actively do something about it. Um, so we were sort of, OK, let's go back again, because by now, surely the supply chain's driving all this through. And we went back again in May 2022, and we found exactly the same results. So I, you know, I'm a great believer in saying to people, if you don't think you've got power, but you work for somebody, you actually have a huge amount of power. If you have, you know, your superannuation, you have a huge amount of power. So I, you know, it can be so often quite despairing from a personal perspective to think, you know, I've actually got no, um, no way of uh, impacting change. And yet our surveys with business show that to be the exact opposite. 
Um, the other thing that um, was really interesting from the survey that we did was that the amount of organisations, okay, 50% still haven't done anything, which is quite a big number. Um, but I think for a lot of them that's because it's actually quite complex. And we know from the survey that we did in May 2022, COVID has been a big impact to, to business. You know, they're, they're doing their own business, so they've got their core business to worry about. You know, they've got all the implications of COVID and then, of course, all the implications of climate change. So it's a huge amount to actually manage. And, but saying that, 45% have now started on some form of reduction strategy, which is, you know, greatly increased from the um, survey that we did back in August 2022. And, you know, these are statistics, and statistics are kind of great. Um, they tell us something. I'm not sure sometimes how much, but they tell us something. And I just want to reflect on some of the conversations that I actually have with business owners. And, you know, quite often the conversations I have are very personal conversations. So people talk about, you know, their grandchildren, their children, how can they make a difference? You know, how can their business help to create an impact? And they're looking to do that in ways that, yes, provide innovation for them within their business, but they are actually concerned about those sort of wider societal impacts as well. You know, there is that element of civic society that's kind of running through, um, through business. And I think we sometimes forget that. And particularly when we sort of lump organisations all together, you know, it's organisations and government, organisations and government need to do something. Um, and yes, you know, we heard this morning about those organisations that probably are sitting in the delay side. They're probably not sitting on the right side of history when we come down to it. But when we're talking about ordinary um, business owners at the sort of small, medium and even large sized businesses, they are actually, in my opinion, and from the ones that I speak to, deeply caring about, you know, what happens and how they can have an impact. And I just wanted to sort of briefly on the other part of the, um, the work that we sort of did, which was to look at the restoration economy. So, you know, we've done a lot of damage since we've been here. That's just a fact. You know, the, um, the Indigenous people cared for this country for millennia before that. And you know, when I take a drive, I'm, I live in Western Australia, and I take a drive out to our wheat belt and see the devastation that's been wrought in the wheat belt. I'm saddened by how quickly that's happened and what an impact. And so we need really to be invigorating that restoration economy, but we can only do that together with the indigenous people um, here in Australia. And you know, it can sound kind of the restoration economy, but you know, it can create huge amounts of jobs. Um, Clean State looked at the jobs alone in Western Australia. It was about 6,500. That was a fairly conservative estimate of the number of jobs that can be created through the restoration economy. And there's just so much ability for us to begin to work together and to begin to really you put our hearts back into this country and to care for it in ways that um, we need to be shown how. So, yeah, it was a survey, but I think one that has a lot of deeper, you know, things and messages that we perhaps need to listen to beyond just the statistical evidence. Perhaps we're reaching a tipping point. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions from um, the room or reflections from the room. Is there any questions? And we'll bring a mic to you. have one in the front just here. Hi. Yeah, Nigel Bradshaw here. Um, I'm a climate fintech founder. Thanks so much for all of that you've said. I'm just wondering, uh, particularly the comments around the employees uh, driving action, what do you think it is that's going to really take to capture the social change of the everyday Australian towards, uh, you know, making mainstream, you know, this, the transition and renewable? Because even though obviously we've seen big shifts uh, even just this year, it still seems that it's not quite mainstream just yet. Just interested in people's thoughts, please. Can I start with you on that one, Louise? Absolutely. 
So I think one of the things that we really hear from um, employees is they want a solutions-focused approach. Um, yes, we have to tell the truth about what's happening in our climate. People need to know. But I think, you know, beyond that, there, you know, we have to turn that despair then into action and into actual actions that people can take themselves, which is more taking out your recycling, <laughs> which is not a bad thing to do, but, you know, actually understanding, you know, how they can take a role. And I think even, you know, it can be as simple as people telling their stories. And that storytelling aspect um, is a huge part of that because when people actually hear what other people have done, um, they can then identify themselves with change. Um, one of the things that we do as an organisation is we, we run, run a podcast where we just ask you know, people to come along and just tell their story. And you know, we hear a lot of feedback about how inspirational that is and how it can encourage people to then take steps themselves. Um, particularly in organisations, you know, when people get a win, it's so exciting for them, you know, whatever that win might be, uh, you know, whether it's um, the organisation making a decision to become carbon neutral or, you know, just to deal with waste issues, for example, people can feel really empowered by that. So I think for me, the answer to that is empower it, showing people that they can be empowered to take action. Positive stories, I couldn't agree more. Akash, could I bring you in on this one as well? Um, just not only about employees, but members of the super fund and how you're finding they're responding to the, the moment that we're in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I, I think we are seeing a strong um, desire from, from members of the super funds to, to see that, you know, through super. I think I agree with, with all the other comments that it's people want to be able to know that there's a, something they can actually do. Um, what, what's part of our plan, part of the way we've engaged is sort of recognising there's the particular thing you can do, but climate is ultimately a systemic challenge. And so it's what can you do which can actually influence the bigger picture that's been really valuable and why we've a lot of our approaches said, well, how much is it about what we do, but how much is it about what we do in collaboration with others and how we influence others as well. Um, a, a particular focus of our client plan is working with the health and community sector. Um, you know, we kind of know health workers are sometimes at the front line of acute climate, you know, bushfires, floods, all the rest of it. Um, and so one stream of work that we're focusing on is, is actually helping people in the healthcare sector, one re reduce the footprint, the carbon footprint of that sector, but also build resilience and adaptation to um, extreme events in communities. And Ginny, the other point that um, Louise was making was around um, story, and you know, story is, as far as I have learned, important, so important and critical to to culture and country protection and care. So do you have reflections on, on that? Well, I think that um, that's a really important part which we know as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge, whether it's Wurundjeri or Wurundjeri, and that's where all things began. And the creation stories tell us exactly how to look after the land and the waters so we don't need an instruction manual, as Uncle Ray was saying. And I think that the one issue too we have to remember since I began at ANU was um, really trying to get up to speed with understanding what Indigenous science is. And this is part and parcel of what we're talking about with climate change and really sharing with people, but understanding with some of the issues you raised as well with intellectual property. Um, I, I know very well how much uh, Aboriginal people want to share uh, their understanding about uh, cool fire farming, for example, and fire management. However, um, there's also an intellectual property element uh, and a very strong one where fee-for-service uh, is and should be offered then for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to participate on that basis, not to merely give knowledge away because we don't do that in a commercial world. Uh, we try to get patents, we try to have uh, non-disclosure agreements and, 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 and other uh, areas of uh, really tying up uh, the legal uh, issues uh, and dotting the I's and crossing the T's. So I think that that's what we've got to remember. Yes, there's a very sharing culture, but you've always got to remember that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and many of the community members that are here today 
that uh, have such a reduced capacity because um, we're grieving about deaths in custody. We're grieving about raising the age that it's still uh, not acceptable. It should be raised by every state and territory across this uh, nation to 14 because a lot of young people are being held in custody. So you mightn't think that these are climate change issues, but they are because everything is a connectivity to each other. And we're connected to you as the audience and the participants and to my colleagues here. So that story has so many moving parts. And when we go to the United Nations, again, we're sharing stories with other Indigenous peoples through the Indigenous peoples and local community meetings. So, you know, we can see that uh, that changed environment, for example, across Finland or um, United States and Canada, their commonalities that we share in that narration of, of understanding. Uh, and uh, we, on a daily basis, are really living um, the uh, issues of climate change. And we know that the seasons are changing and we know that particularly in Western Australia, there's one tree that flowers once a year and it's flowering six times. So those bioindicators are really critical um, that we have uh, understood as Indigenous science. And even if we actually, as an audience and participants, took on those seasons of Aboriginal knowledge, um, the, the weather seasons, for example, that would be a, really an, a, a, a knowledge to take in part and in full with climate change and an understanding of our environment because we don't have four seasons. But market and industry, yes, I agree. Um, that's part and parcel of what my colleagues have been saying. And the investment in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities is really important. And there are really uh, amazing land councils out there and also uh, private entrepreneurs and startups. So we, we must really focus not only on the cultural depth of knowledge, but also our current um, uh, capacity for really participating in the market. And I think um, really giving those young ones, those grannies, an opportunity not only to share who they are with you, but also sit beside you and learn those Western skills. Uh, and I think that that's a great combination. So really working on that principles of connection and exchange and collaboration. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. We've got just about one minute left for this session. Is there any last questions? I can see Jenny here. Um, Jenny Goldie, I'm representing two NGOs, Climate Action Monero and Sustainable Population Australia. Question to Professor Prasad. There's clearly hundreds of jobs in this renewable transition in Australia. Um, do we skills in Australia um, or do we have to, how, how many of these um, new jobs uh, do we have to import, how many skills do we have to import? Um, can, a, are our educational institutions keeping up with supplying the skills that are needed? So, yes, uh, thanks for that. Uh, there are, there, there is, the change is going to be progressive. So it's not suddenly like one day you need, you know, 50,000 more people. Uh, retraining uh, existing workforce is a very important thing. I think even uh, engineers, qualified graduate engineers who have been working there for a long time, when you put this overlay of low carbon designs or net zero carbon buildings and so forth, or product design, uh, they don't have the skill set because it wasn't part of their training. So there is a lot of training from vocational level all the way to post-professional micro-credentials and all of that that's needed to train the people we have already. But then you, we, we're looking at new skills uh, coming of uh, such a massive shift to a, a different way uh, of providing the basic uh, amenities. Uh, and and uh, we, in, in my trailblazer uh, <coughs> hub, for example, there is significant provision for, for looking at uh, training and, and identifying and delivering on new skills required. But 
uh, there, uh, we always rely on getting more people from abroad. We have this policy, broadly speaking, that we try and attract local PhD candidates, for example. But uh, the numbers that show up are much smaller and we end up having to bring uh, candidates, uh, good quality candidates for PhDs, for example, from abroad. Uh, and uh, often we lose them, uh, uh, but there are times when they stay back and become part of the resource base in the country. Uh, I think they are at the summit last week, they were beginning to look at uh, the student cohort uh, and how you could uh, make sure that they contribute to the country afterwards, uh, even if they come from other countries, at least for a short period of time. I think we need to look at a lot of policies that, that enable flexibility in terms of meeting our needs uh, in the medium to long term. Would you like to add to that, Michael? Yeah, I guess, um, from, I suppose from my experience, we've, uh, less from the academic perspective, but certainly in industry, there is so many people who, are, who have got um, a lot of skills. Certainly retraining is, is something because, you know, these ideas are very new, not even, not, not just in Australia, but around the world. Uh, you know, clean, clean buildings and other things like this, it requires retraining. Uh, in you know how to test strength of concrete and things like that. So there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of changes uh, that people need to get used to. But I suppose coming coming back to your question before about how to how to engage people, how to how to encourage those employees to to really get involved. Um, uh, it, it is about that positive message. I mean, we, we as as you said before, the Calix motto is Mars is for quitters, um, and it's it's. It, it's because we focus on on solutions. Um, we've we have recruited people who are climate deniers into our organisation, um, and it, it like a challenge. We do like a challenge, but you know they're, they're skilled people, um, and it only takes about six months to, for, for people as, as soon as they they can see they can make a difference. Um, then they go, well, what am I making a difference to? And they start investigating it, and they start inquiring about, you know, what's happening in the world. They start reading actual scientific papers and things like this, and they realise, you know, there, there's, I'm making a difference. It's bringing meaning to me, um, and and that's really what boosts, you know, morale in a company and creates success long term. Because you know, when if a company's going through a bit of a dip, I mean, you've talked about the. The valley of death with with the um, <laughs> with the uh, the academics. Um, it, it takes people. Um, it, it, it takes courage to stick it out in those in those times where things are a little bit more difficult. And the only way you get that is is through that the the the, the positive projects, positive messaging, and making sure that people know they're making a difference. I'm sure everyone here will agree. We've heard some um, hopeful messages today. So we've learned about some opportunities and, you know, some reflections that we've all got about how we can better collaborate, leverage our networks and success. So thanks to all of our panellists today. And thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, so exciting to see actual things happening on the ground. Thank you, panel. In a moment, we're going to be taking a break at four o'clock uh, while, uh, while all of us in person are going to sort ourselves out uh, into our workshop rooms. We will be giving a special treat for people online with one last set from Nidala. And when we come back, we're going to be all in our sector workshops. Now, remember, all of our content is going to be recorded. It'll be available for the next three months after this event, so you don't need to worry about missing out if you're missing out on a workshop. Speaking of workshops, there are nine of them to choose for. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so for our in-person audience, let's make our way out the door now. Uh, and our folks outside will help you, guide you to the right room where you might like to go. Uh, there's going to be lots of great workshops hosted by lots of good people. I'm hosting one. I'm sorry if you're in that one. Um, that's all I'll say about that one, but it's going to be fun. All right, so if you head to your rooms now, um, we're going to be starting those workshops right on at 4 o'clock. Um, so you've got about half an hour to do that. Now, for our online audience, please head back to our virtual lobby and choose which workshop you'd like to be part of um, in, in a little bit. Uh, and after the workshops, 
you'll all be magic back into a final remark session from me, and then uh, and that'll be it for the online session. So, everyone else online, please give it up for Nadalia. And anyone else here left, give it up for Nadalia one more time. beautiful online community. Um, this is a little present that's supposed to be just for you, but we have some strapless, so it might be them too. pretty big floods. Um, so this song was written in that context. Thanks, you can switch me off. 